the book of Daniel today. We come to Daniel chapter 2, and we begin our study in verse 21. Daniel 2, verse 21. And Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the Israelites were taken into Babylonian captivity. Babylon, led by King Nebuchadnezzar, conquered the land of Israel because of their sin against God. And God uh, allowed the Israelites to be taken into Babylon. Among the Israelites were Daniel and his three friends, young men, possibly teenagers. They rose to positions of importance in the uh, court of Nebuchadnezzar the king. And um, the king, last time we saw, had a dream. And it, it was a very troubling dream. He knew it meant something, but he wasn't sure what. And none of his spiritual advisors, the astrologers, and those into the occult could tell him what his dream was because he wanted them to tell him what the dream was and then give the interpretation. None of them could do it. And he was so angry that he ordered that all of his spiritual advisors be put to death. Unfortunately, among them were Daniel and his three friends. Now, they were not into the occult, but nevertheless, they were kind of, they were kind of uh, thrown into that group. So they had a death sentence as well. Daniel found out about it. He said, could I just have time to pray to my God? And maybe God will give us your dream and the answer. And we pick it up in verse 17 of chapter 2. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. And then verse 22, he reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with him. And so Daniel says that God gives wisdom to the wise, and wisdom is his gift to those who ask for it. God also reveals things that would otherwise be unknown to people. God can do that because he alone knows everything about everything past, present, and future. So that's no problem for God. That's why he was able to tell Daniel what the king dreamed and also what the dream meant, because it was a dream from him. It was a revelation. 23, he continues, I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Daniel got an answer from God, and he will relay it to the king. It is a message for the king. He got a message from God. He doesn't have to make something up like the king's former spiritual advisors used to do whenever they so-called interpreted a dream. Daniel wouldn't do that sort of thing anyway. He wouldn't make things up. But he doesn't have to because he has, he has received the word of God and like it or not, the king is going to hear it. 24. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Now, notice the kindness of Daniel. God gave him the dream, and the interpretation. Now remember, all of those astrologers and and uh, those who were into the occult, the king was putting them all to death for being frauds. But notice, Daniel was a kind, tender-hearted person here. 
The first thing he requests is that the bloodshed would stop. He interceded on behalf of those occultists. And of course, Daniel could have said, hey, listen, I've got the answer. My God gave me the answer, so spare me and let the others die. I really don't care. They're sinners anyway. He could have said that, but he didn't. Instead, he says, I've got the answer. So there's no need for any more killing. Please put a stop to all this killing. And there's a lesson for us there. God's people should be in favor of life across the board. Not just unborn babies, not just children, but the elderly, the sick, the infirmed. We should be in favor of life. It is all very precious to God. All human life is. 25. Ariach took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. What a great impression Daniel must have made on the king's servant, Ariach. Just think about this. He went up to Ariach and said, Hey, God gave me the dream and the interpretation. Ariach, the king's official, says, Okay, I'll take you to the king and tell him. Now, like I said, he must have made a great impression on Ariach. Daniel must have proved himself to be a man of integrity. He had to have proved himself to be a person of integrity, or the king's servant never would have brought him to the king, saying, I found a man who can interpret your dream, king. Because if Daniel doesn't interpret the king's dream, Ariok will be as dead as Daniel for raising the hopes of the king. So you got one person who believes in Daniel, and that's this Ariok fella. His word is as good as gold. 26. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Now the king was told, Daniel can tell you, and he will do it. And then the king asked Daniel, Can you do it? The king is skeptical. It's understandable. None of the Babylonian uh, spiritual advisors and their idols had been able to interpret the dream. As a result, he's not exactly sold on the idea that Daniel's God can do it either. 27. Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. Daniel says, I can't do it. No one can. No human being can do this. And so Daniel reminds the king that his soothsayers and the idols they call on failed. They failed, as we will see, because they were not connected to the one true God. Daniel says, no one can do it. No man can do it. And then he says in verse 28, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. Now, I think... It's very likely, and I think the context will prove this out, could be that Nebuchadnezzar, the night that he had that dream, before he had the dream, he had been in his bedroom, whatever, sitting on his bed and thinking about what next? What next for me and this great kingdom? What next? After all, I have conquered the whole world. I am, I am the most powerful man on earth. Babylon is the great world empire. What next? Well, God answered his what next because his dream was all about the future. Verse 29, Daniel says, As you were laying there, O king, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. In other words, king, the God of heaven knows you were thinking about what would happen next. And now, he will tell you what's going to happen next. And I bet this opening statement of Daniel caused the king's ears to perk up immediately. How did Daniel know that I was thinking about that the night that I had the dream? How did he know that I was thinking, what next? Well, Daniel's just getting started. 
30. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than other living men, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Before the king gets too impressed with Daniel, Daniel wants to cut that off right away. He says, it's not me, king. It's not me. I'm nothing special. He wants the king to be impressed with God, not with him. 31. You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. And old Nebuchadnezzar, I think, is becoming a real believer in Daniel's ability right about now because he describes a massive image that the king saw in his dream. It was huge, it was frightening, and to the king it was, and it was exactly what he dreamt. Let's look at this vision, this dream. Verse 32. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. And so the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in this dream that Daniel describes right here, this image had a gold head. But then, as you look down on this image, the lower you got, the substance of the image became less and less valuable. It was gold on the top, a little lower, it was silver, a little lower, it was bronze, a little lower, then it was iron mixed with clay. Then notice what the king saw in verse 34. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. A rock that was not in any way connected to the image came out of nowhere and struck the image in its feet and shattered it, shattered the feet and the whole works, because look at verse 35. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Look at this. The stone totally pulverizes the entire image. It smashed this image representing four kingdoms. Smashed it to pieces. And then the whole thing just was blown off the face of the earth. And then that little stone cut out by not human hands took the place of the statue filling up the entire earth. 36. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Daniel hasn't even gotten to the interpretation yet, but you can bet that he has the king's attention because he related the dream precisely as it happened. 37. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of kings. He was the most powerful king on earth. But only because God had made it happen. Only because the God of heaven ordained it to be that way. And so the king has no reason to be arrogant because God made him everything that he is. And that's just like you and I. We have no reason to be arrogant about any success that we might have because Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. 38. It says, in your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. The Lord God had made Nebuchadnezzar the mightiest man on earth. He was able to boss everyone around. And he is represented by the head of gold on this statue. He and the kingdom of Babylon. They are the head of gold. Then 39. 
After you, another kingdom will rise, inferior, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be... Well, let's stop right there for a second. I just want to say something. That gold head represented Babylon. The next kingdom that will arise, represented by the silver, is the Persian Empire. After that, a third kingdom, represented by the bronze will be Greece. And you know what? That is exactly, you check it out in the history books, that is exactly how history played itself out. God gave the history of the Gentile world in a nutshell to Nebuchadnezzar in this revelation. He summarized the history of the Gentile world in this vision, this dream. And there's still more in verse 40. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. For as iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. The fourth kingdom, represented by iron, is the Roman Empire. Iron is not valuable, not like, not like gold or silver, even bronze. But it is hard, and it is tough. And that characterized the Roman Empire perfectly. It ruled with an iron fist. 41. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. It will be a divided kingdom, God says. The iron feet were mixed with clay. Clay speaks of weakness. If iron speaks of strength, then the clay speaks of weakness. They were iron and clay, partly strong, partly weak. That's exactly how the Roman Empire was. It was partly strong, partly weak. Their military was strong. Nobody could mess with Rome. But their morality was weak, and that was a big problem for the Roman Empire. 42. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. The ten toes actually represent the fragmentation of the Roman Empire into ten kingdoms. You know, Rome never really was conquered. You study history, it wasn't conquered. There was, there was no fifth great world empire. Rome wasn't conquered, it just kind of fell apart. It was fragmented, according to verse 42, into ten kingdoms, the ten toes. And this occurred when the barbaric tribes outside the boundaries of Rome, when they attacked the empire little by little from the outside and sort of chipped away at it until it divided into the ten nations that make up Western Europe. It's a fascinating. If you like history, study, study the history of the world after the days of the Roman Empire. Really fascinating how, how Europe developed in the area where the Roman Empire was in control, just exactly as Daniel stated it would be in this dream. It continues in verse 43. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. The Romans, in other words, will intermarry. They will mix with the other nations that come in among them, the iron mixed with clay. But those nations which formed out of Rome are not going to be strong like the empire had once been. Like iron and clay do not mix, so there will be a divided Europe. And there has been ever since the Roman Empire crumbled. 44. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold into pieces. Well, that little stone, that little stone 
which was cut out without human hands. It seemed to come out of nowhere. The little stone in the dream that smashed the image to pieces represents the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. And so here it is. One kingdom, one great world empire, succeeded another. There was Babylon. There was Persia. There was Greece. There was Rome. One succeeded another, just as God said that would happen, until the kingdom of heaven came. And Jesus Christ began that kingdom of heaven during the days of Rome, just exactly as this taught. The kingdom of heaven began when the church began. And long after Rome fell to pieces, the church is still going strong. Revelation 11.15 says, The kingdom, kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And that occurred, that began during the days of the Roman Empire, just like the dream foretold. 45, last part of it. Well, let's, let's, let's read the whole verse. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. The small stone cut out of the mountains, and here's the important part, without human hands. That without human hands part is very important. That pictures the deity of Jesus Christ. The final kingdom, which will crush all rebellious kingdoms, is the kingdom of God, ruled by God, the Lord Jesus Christ. 46. Then Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king starts to worship Daniel. He saw the supernatural ability of God working through Daniel, and I suppose he, he thought Daniel was some sort of a god or demigod or something. 47. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Well, Nebuchadnezzar knows that Daniel's God is God. You see, I think this is why God went, uh, went about this in such a roundabout way. I mean, he could have just spoke to you know, Nebuchadnezzar in plain old Babylonian English so that he would understand. But instead, he spoke to him in a dream, and it, and it was a mystery. And Nebuchadnezzar's false gods and his priests and his spiritual advisors, see, they couldn't interpret it. But then Daniel did interpret it because he got the message from God, and now Nebuchadnezzar knows that God is God. Kind of neat how God does that sort of thing. And God did something that no other gods could do. 48. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position, lavished many gifts on him. He made him rule over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. God did the work. Certainly, God did the work, but Daniel got the benefits. What a deal. And the same thing happens with Christians. You know, God gives us the power to be holy. God works in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. The Bible says it's all him. And then we get the benefits of holiness. And we get the rewards in eternity too. 49. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Daniel didn't forget his three Jewish friends. You can see that Daniel was pretty smart. He struck while the iron was hot. I mean, as long as the king was in such a good mood toward him, he got favors for his three friends right away, too. Meanwhile, Daniel became the king's number one advisor. And so we see that God, sooner or later, rewards those who, like Daniel, stay faithful to him. Pick it up in chapter 3 next time. Until then, so long, everyone.